Mark chapter 4. Our study this morning begins in verse 35 through the end of the chapter. Not a lot of verses, but a lot of stuff in here. Mark chapter 4, would you read along with me, please? That day, when evening came, he said to his disciples, Let us go over to the other side. Let me read it again. Let us go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along, just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with him. A furious squall came up, and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? He got up. Imagine Jesus just sort of stretching and getting up and going out. It says in the next verse, He got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, Quiet, be still. Then, and the idea here in Greek is instantly, the wind died down and it was completely calm. He said to his disciples, Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? And again, the idea there is, do you still have no faith after everything you've seen? I mean, imagine what these disciples have seen. And now they're afraid. He goes, do you still have no faith? They were terrified and asked each other, Who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. Father, I prayed at last service. I'll do it this time too. Lord, we want to be like the wind and the waves. It's amazing to me, Jesus, that the only creation that disobeyed you was human beings. The demons obeyed, and they hated you. The wind and the waves obeyed. We can go through the Gospels and fish obeyed, and just humans, Lord. Well, we don't want to be those people. Today, Lord, fill us overflowing with your Spirit. And help every single one of us here today, Lord, who is going through a trial, a storm. For the people who are not in a storm right now, we know they soon will be. So prepare them as well. And may we bring you honor and glory even in the middle of the lake when it seems like we're all going to drown. By the power of your Spirit, Lord, When you ask the question, why are we afraid? Do you still have no faith? Let our answer be, yes, Lord, we trust you. Finally, Jesus, I pray if there's anyone here in this second service, if they don't know you if they're not yet born again, I pray that this would be the day that they would surrender their hearts to you. Call them by name. Maybe you can even tell them to be still because you have something for them. Prepare them to draw them to you for your glory. We love you, God. We praise you. We ask that you really minister to our hearts. And for those in a storm, Jesus, just whisper, be still. We ask this for your glory. Amen. I quote 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 2 to you a lot. And today's study is the reason I do. It is required, Paul writes to the church at Corinth, that every man, every woman given a trust by God must prove faithful. It's a test, and the tests never stop coming. Now, I'm also aware that most of us don't like tests and trials. But you see, we can't avoid them. And I'm not going to be naive and ask you to enjoy them. What I am going to ask you to do today is to embrace the storms in your life because you need them. It's in the storms where Jesus is able to show off for us. It's in those storms where Jesus is able to say, see, I saved you, I got you through it. It's in those times when we're the most afraid when Jesus will show off the most to us. And when we are across the storm, when we're on the other side, what, what happens then is we realize that, Jesus, you were always there. You were with me. And I survived. And guess what? I know you better. And I trust you more. 
I'll also say this, that every storm in life, every test, every trial is preparation for the next storm. So we need to learn to embrace them. Some years ago, Paul and I were on vacation. We have a son who lives in Palm Desert, California. And we went out there, and we go in the summertime, so it was like a billion degrees. But, but we were there, and, and we were in a hotel, and we had some couple, three hours before we needed to be ready to go to uh, an appointment that we had with the kids. And I just thought, you know, I'm going to go down by the pool and just sort of pray and just hang out. So I went down by the pool by myself, and while I was sitting there, it, it, it attracted my attention. There was this young, one young man. He was tall, but he was probably only six or seven years old. And he really, 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 really wanted to jump in the pool. But he was afraid. And his father, who was also very tall, they had very thick Eastern European accents. And, and, and the father would get in the pool and he would tell the son to jump. And the son would bend over and he was just almost ready to leave and then he just couldn't do it. Now this went on and on and on. Literally for two hours this went on. And he'd get to the point and the father would say, I've got you, I'll catch you, jump. And the son would get all excited and, and then he'd start running around the pool again because he just couldn't bring himself to jump. Now I had an appointment so I had to go. I tried to last long enough to see how it ended. <laughs> but I couldn't. So I had to go. The next morning I ran into the father in the restaurant and I went up and sort of introduced myself and said, I'm sorry if I'm bothering you, but, but I, I just had to ask, I watched you and your son in the pool yesterday, and for two hours he wanted to jump. You could tell how much he wanted to jump, and I just needed to find out, did he ever jump? <laughs> and the man looked at me, and instantly his face got really sad. And he said, I'm sorry to say, he didn't trust his father enough to jump. And I walked away and I thought, that really is sad. It really affected the father. Our study this morning is about jumping. Not a six or seven year old kid, but you and me. About jumping when Jesus says jump. It's about learning that He's in the pool. He's saying, I got you. Jump. It's going to be okay. And even when we're afraid, even when we look at the pool and the water, instead we'll decide to look at Jesus and take him at his word that he's got us. Everybody, let's jump with Jesus. Verse 35 says, that day, now this is the same day that he taught in parables. That day when evening came, he said to his disciples, let's go over to the other side. You might want to highlight that because there's no ambiguity in that statement. It's in red letters in your Bible. It came from Jesus' mouth. Let us go over to the other side. There was no doubt that they were going to go over to the other side. Jesus had already said, we're going and the disciples now had a decision to make. Now from this point in Mark chapter 4 all the way through chapter 5, this is an incredible portion of Scripture. Because from now until the end of chapter 5, we see Jesus in absolute victory over nature, over demons, over death, over disease, over the devil. That's why this is so exciting, this portion of Scripture. Now, the placement of this first miracle is, I believe, truly inspired. It's as though Jesus, you remember he's been teaching his disciples in minute detail. He's the one who, the parable of the sower, he gave them the definition of it. They didn't have to guess. He pulled them aside. He's been teaching them all these things. Here's your job. You go scatter seed. Here's what it means. And then he's been explaining the other things to them. So with all this detail, the purpose of him explaining is because they're now going to have this test. This is a test, I believe, with all of my heart, is brought on by Jesus himself. He knows what the enemy's going to do. I'll talk about that in a moment. But the idea here is he knows that they need to be tested. Always amazes me. At this point in Jesus' life, he knew 
what his disciples were going to go through over the next two years. He knew every test. He knew about every trial. And his job was to prepare them for those trials. It begins, preparation always begins with a test. Now, in exactly the same way, Jesus knows the trials that you're going to go through. He doesn't cause them, but he knows the trials that are going to come in your life, and he has a purpose in them. In the same way, he has a purpose in this test for his disciples. He wants to find out how much they learned. We're going to find out they didn't learn very much. I want to re-emphasize before moving on that Jesus has already told them that they're going to the other side of the lake. He says it before there's any storm. The storm doesn't change Jesus' mind. It doesn't change the destination for all of them. He's going to the other side. As long as they're with him, he's going to make it. We serve a God that can do anything. If you're here this morning and you're in a storm or you're being tested by the Lord, Whatever the circumstance, we serve a God who can get you through anything. It's Jesus in the pool and he's saying, trust me and jump. I've got you. And he wants us to desperately learn that we can trust him. And the more we trust him, the easier it becomes to trust him, even when the trials get more difficult. But what he wants us to do is be ready to jump. Now, I'm going to ask you just to sort of sit back And let these verses I'm going to read to you from Romans chapter 8 just sort of wash over you. One of our problems in believing the promises of God is our faith is small sometimes. And this is a God that you can trust. It's from Romans chapter 8, beginning in verse 35. He says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Let this wash over you, for I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. You see, that's Jesus telling all of us, no matter the trial, no matter the storm you're in, we're all going to go to the other side. As long as we're with Jesus, we're going to go to the other side. Now, we've read ahead. We know what happens in this story. But these disciples experienced fishermen They know every inch of this lake. It's the Sea of Galilee, but it's really more of a lake. It's 14 miles wide, or 14 miles long and 8 miles wide. It's a lake that is known for these kind of squalls to come up regularly. The cold air coming out of Lebanon would come in to meet the warm, humid air over the lake. And, And these storms would come up instantly with no warning at all. It's been reported that there were as high as eight foot waves on this lake. I mean, we could surf those waves. The disciples knew all of that. All of that to say, nothing can keep you from getting where God tells you you're going to go. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2 is about the perfect, pleasing, and acceptable will of God and how we can find it. Nothing can keep you. If you just hang out with Jesus, if you are where he is, no matter what you're going through, nothing can keep you from meeting and surviving and even thriving through those trials. All of that to say, these disciples, with what they've seen Jesus do already, they shouldn't have been afraid. Now they were. None of us in this room should ever be afraid. But we are. We're human. That's the human condition. I wish I could stand before you and say, well, I'm so spiritual. I'm never afraid. I'm terrified. But the choice is, Are we going to take Jesus at his word when he said we need to go to the other side? If we have any hesitation, there's always going to be an enemy there. And he's going to try to get us to look at the circumstances of the storm instead of focusing on him. That little boy who wouldn't jump. He was fine. He was looking at his father, but then he would look at the water and he just couldn't make himself do it. Well, that's what happens to us in the middle of our storms. Jesus says, just keep your eyes on me 
and it's going to be okay. We don't want to change direction because we all want to walk in the perfect will of God. It says in verse 36, leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just as he was in the boat. Now, I don't know what that means, just as he was. I have a feeling that what it means is that Jesus said, I'm going to the boat. And they followed him in. He didn't stop. He didn't get a coat. He didn't get a life preserver. He didn't get anything. He just said, let's get in the boat and let's go. It says there were also other boats with him. So now there's a flotilla. You know, Jesus was always being pursued by the crowds, and they too would be out there in that lake. And verse 37 says, A furious squall came up, and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Now, I told you about the storms that come up on this lake. I think there's another element here. Later when we read, Jesus rebuked the wind and the waves. That's a strong word in Greek, and it's the same word that's used when he's rebuking demons, and demons are coming out. All of that to say, I believe that this was a satanically inspired storm. That's why it was so much worse. I mean, if you've got experienced fishermen, men who know every inch of that lake, if you've got experienced fishermen and they're frightened, this was an unusual, out-of-the-ordinary storm. Now, obviously, Jesus knew that was going to be the case. That didn't change his mind. He didn't say, well, let's go this. No, wait a minute. The devil's going to cause something to happen. He said, get in the boat. He said, get in the boat. Now, the way we think as humans, and one of the goals is to get us to think a little bit differently about the storms of life. We wonder sometimes, why does God allow us to go through these things? I think there's an underlying, with a lot of help from the devil, I think there's an underlying sentiment that says, well, if I'm following Jesus, then everything should go okay. If Jesus is sending me to do this, well, then he ought to provide. If Jesus asks me to go there, then he ought to be make sure that I'm successful in what I'm going to do. The Bible promises no such circumstances. Jesus himself the very first part of his ministry after being baptized or, or by John the, the Baptist was to be led by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted directly by the devil himself. Jesus said, if I had to go through a storm, if I had to go through a trial, why do you think you can escape it? Now, I know why we don't like tests. I know why we don't want to be in storms. What I don't know is where we get that idea because it certainly doesn't come from Scripture. You see, tests and storms are vital to our spiritual health. Peter will later say that those tests and trials are more precious to us than gold because they prove our faith. They prove that our faith is genuine. And as I said earlier, every time we get through one storm, on the other side of that storm, we know more about Jesus and we trust him a little bit more. And we say, okay, Lord, you, you delivered me through this one. Praise the Lord, and, and now we're ready to follow you. Well, he's going to lead us right into another storm because as our faith needs to increase, faith needs to be exercised. As our faith needs to increase, so too will the trials and the storms. Now, that doesn't mean we should be afraid of them. You say, well, I don't want trials and storms, so I'm not going to walk by faith. Remember, without faith, it's impossible to please God. And we have to learn faith. It's something that needs to be practiced. It's not instinctive for any of us. When the Bible says that we're to walk by faith and not by sight, there isn't one person in this room who wouldn't rather do it just the other way around. I want to walk by sight. Why? Because I can see where I'm going. I don't want to deal with my feelings. Lord, if I'm afraid, just put your arms around me and make me feel better. Jesus says, you need these storms. That's why I asked you earlier to learn to embrace them. Now, these 12, as experienced fishermen, this storm seems to be way beyond their abilities. That is by design. Jesus puts us in circumstances that are beyond our abilities, and he has one purpose in doing so, and that's so that we won't try in our own strength to get out of it. He wants us to be in a place every day where we are 100% dependent upon him. 
We have no way out. We're not going to go find help from another human. Lord, I'm, I'm in this, and there's nothing I can do but hold on to you. And Jesus, if you could hear his voice, he would say, well, that's exactly where I want you to be. That's why we need these storms or these furious squalls, so that Jesus can show off and show us his strength and show us his love. And we remember that Jesus knew this storm was coming. We also remember that he said, we're going to the other side. Jesus remained in the boat. And all we have to do is remain in the boat. And we can't miss the destination. One of the reasons I tell you so often, just be with Jesus, is because if you're with Jesus, you cannot miss his perfect will for your life. And as Christians, we're like everybody else. We, we want some certainty. We want some assurance. And we think about the will of God and it's where we want to be. We know it's where we ought to be. But too often, because we don't know what the will of God is going to be in two years or five years or ten years, you know, we want God to give us the long-term plan. He just never does. And he says, how about you follow me? And too many of us were worried about missing out on God's will. If you're with Jesus, if you're in the boat with him, you cannot miss his perfect will. Verse 38 says Jesus was in the boat. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? No, I don't know if Jesus was a heavy sleeper. I know he didn't get a lot of rest. I know the spiritual attacks that he was under. I imagine Jesus would take a moment, any moment he could steal away to get a nap. He was in the stern. He was sleeping on a cushion. Now, what's going to freak them out, Jesus is sleeping through. Now, I know there's times when we feel like Jesus is asleep on the job for us. But it's okay if he sleeps, as long as you're with him. In those times when he's sleeping, you know, those times when you can't really hear his voice. Maybe you're in the word, but, but it's really not speaking to your heart. And you've got more questions and you've got answers. And you're starting to get just a little bit nervous about things. In those times, Jesus is asleep because he's teaching you to trust him. He's teaching you to trust him. He'll never leave you. He certainly doesn't want you to deal with things on your own terms. There may be times when it actually feels like he's left you. God, why aren't you answering me? But he's always there if you're where he is. Now, this is an honest question. Don't you care if we drown. That's what happens when you look at circumstances. Did Jesus care if they drown? I mean, we've just gone through the process in these early chapters of the Gospel of Mark where he's called them individually. The Father gave him the names of the people to call. Of course he cares about them. Of course he has a plan for them. He's already appointed them to be his disciples, to soon be apostles. They were the ones that were going to carry on the work of the church that turned the world right side up without the benefit of modern communication methods like we have. Of course he cared about them. But all they could think about was, we're going to drown and he doesn't care. Now I wonder if Jesus got up a little grumpy. And I say that because I don't wake up well. If I take a nap, I'm not good. I'm the guy that goes home after Sunday's services and says, Tavala, I'm not going to sleep today. No nap today. And she goes, oh, yeah, right. <laughs> Paul is a professional napper, by the way. <laughs> but I'm not. I wonder if Jesus was just a little bit grumpy. I'm with you here. You're going to be okay. I wonder if he had a private moment between him and his father and said, well, well why don't they trust me yet? Remember, Jesus was human too. Why don't they trust me yet? And yet because they asked an honest question, Jesus can deal with it. Now he's going to rebuke them. He's going to be really direct with them. But it's okay to ask God questions. It's not okay ever to question God. And I'm assuming this was an honest question 
don't you care if we drown? They're looking at the circumstances and all they can think about is we're going to die out here and he's asleep. Why doesn't he do something? But what they need to know before he does anything at all is that he cares about them. Infinitely so. That's what we need to remember when we're in a storm. He's sleeping. He knows they're going to be okay. Why shouldn't he sleep? I don't know how long it takes typically to sail eight miles the width of the Sea of Galilee. But it'd be a good time for him to get maybe a couple, three hours of sleep. And to the first sign of trouble, they run in, and the thing that they question, are we safe? Don't you care about us? Have you ever been in that situation where a storm came up in your life and you thought, well, God, don't you care about me? Don't you love me? If you love me, why is this happening? I think every one of us in this room, if we're honest, has been in that position. And Jesus didn't get angry with you, but he demonstrated once and for all that he loved you. Now, there's a place where we've got to decide what we really believe, and we've got to believe it at a depth that circumstances won't change it. I know God loves me. I know he loves me because he died for me. I know he loves me because before dying for me, he took the punishment that I deserved because he couldn't bear to see me suffer. That's the demonstration of love that is incontrovertible. We've got to know that, and then when the trial or the storm comes, you won't doubt his love. You won't let your emotions take over. You won't be so focused on the circumstances that you can't see Jesus in the middle of it. All you have to do is stay where he is, to stay in the boat, and you're going to be okay. That's important because I want to tell you one place where none of us are safe. I'm going to ask you to turn ahead to the book of Acts. Acts chapter 27, the next to last chapter. I just want you to see this with your own eyes. The one place you're not safe is if you leave the boat. I like to think of Peter and James and John and the others when they're convinced they're going to drown, they run down. All they had to do was open the little cabin wherever Jesus was sleeping and say, oh, he's still there, we're going to be okay. That's all they had to do. They didn't need to wake him up. They didn't need to question whether or not he cared about them. The one place that you're safe is with Jesus in the boat, the only place you're not safe is when you're not in the place he is. Acts chapter 27. This is the Apostle Paul. They're in a shipwreck. The ship has been destroyed. Paul warned them not to sail. It was too dangerous. They didn't listen. Beginning verse 29, he says, Fearing that we would, this is Luke writing, Fearing that we would be dashed against the rocks, they dropped four anchors from the stern and prayed for daylight. In an attempt to escape from the shop, the sailors let the lifeboat down into the sea, pretending they were going to lower some anchors from the bow. Then Paul said to the centurion and the soldiers, unless these men stay with the ship, you cannot be saved. So the soldiers cut the ropes that held the lifeboat and let it fall away. I wanted you to see that because that's exactly the same thing that is true for us. You can't let circumstances dictate the choices you make. You can't give in to how you feel in the middle of a storm. You got to keep your eyes focused on Jesus. And you know what he'll say? He'll say, jump. You can trust me. Jump. And too many of us, we jump ship, and then we find ourselves in the most dangerous place of all. Maybe a little proud of ourselves for getting out of the storm. But here's something you can write down. Jesus never lets you skip a storm. If you bail, he's going to take you back through another storm. Because we got to learn. we got to learn that he's trustworthy. we got to learn that he loves us. And every one of us here today, we've got to be convinced in our heart and in our soul that he loves us. That he loves us so much that we never again have to question whether or not he cares. He'll never leave you. You're the pearl of great price. If you were the only one, he'd tell you, come on, let's go over to the other side. 
And because it's necessary that we all get to the other side, we really and truly have got to get through those storms. So Jesus, maybe a little grumpy, says he got up in verse 39. He rebuked the wind and said to the waves... Now, the way we typically read something like this, because Jesus is demonstrating his mastery over all creation, we typically hear, think, think of, of hearing him say this like, Quiet, be still! He didn't do that. I think he's a little irritated at the disciples. And he just walks to the edge of the boat and says, Quiet, be still. And instantly... You talk about something that's eerie. Instantly, the water's not even moving anymore. Not a breath of wind. All of those waves, maybe as high as eight foot. Now the water's perfectly calm. And all it is word. All it is word. Now every one of you, I think everyone, I hope and pray every one of you, brought a Bible here today. We've got stories like this so that we can say, at your word, things can be still. You'll be calm. He proved to them how much he cares. In our house, we have a picture, Paul and I do, given to us by a precious couple in church a lot of years ago uh, of this very moment in Scripture. And under the, the picture, it says, peace be still. And Jesus is standing at the front of the boat and his hand is out, kind of showing the mastery. Now the waves are still going. You can still see the wind in there. But the people in the boat, they're terrified. Look on their face. Now, it's in the painting. It's not the disciples. In the painting, in the boat, are people just like you and me. One of them, by the way, is Tiger Woods. There's a picture in there. The guy looks just like Tiger Woods. Got the golf cap on and everything. And they've all got this really scary look on their face. And Jesus just says, peace be still. And because we know what happens next, we, we understand that, that everything immediately quieted down. This is the place where all of them will go, ooh. Because that's really frightening. That kind of power is unbelievable. Peace be still. And if you're in Jesus' boat, you can jump. It doesn't matter what you're afraid of. You can be still. That doesn't mean that fear won't come. It does. But what it means is that we can be still because Jesus has proven just how much he loves us. And that's why he says in verse 40, it's time for a lesson. They failed the test. He said to his disciples, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? Now this is a rebuke. Jesus looking at him and saying, do you, do you remember the lepers? Do you remember the demons that we've been casting out? Do you remember the miracles of healing that we've done? You've seen all of those things and you haven't learned anything from them. Do you still have no faith? Now, faith is an interesting concept. I think a lot of us don't really understand what faith is. Faith is not positive confession. Not faith, or faith is not faking it till you make it. Faith is trusting in God. When things aren't still, will you trust in God? Peace, be still. Jesus said, be anxious for nothing. He tells us over and over, do not worry, be not afraid, do not fear. Hundreds of times, those exhortations are in the Bible, and yet we Christians, we still are afraid. It's okay to be afraid, it's just not okay not to jump. We can't give in to fear because Jesus is trying to teach us to trust him. Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith, he said. You know, the last couple of years, we Christians have had a lot to be afraid about. And we've demonstrated that we have no faith. I'm speaking generally. COVID came and we shut down the churches. The government said stay home and people violated the word of God to stay home. I, I understand people were afraid. But the question is, what will you do with what Jesus has told you to do? As if COVID wasn't... And by the way, there's still churches that will never recover. Thousands of churches in our nation have closed in the last two years. 
There's still people who can't go to their church because their church is only online because they've never recovered. People have gotten into the habit of staying at home and watching online. That's not church. Now, for those of you watching online, it's not personal. <laughs> but we, we did it because we were afraid. And Jesus said, I'm in the middle of the church, Revelation chapter 1. If we're here with Jesus, we're safe. That doesn't mean we're safe from COVID. It means that we're safe with him. It wasn't too long after that that Christians began freaking out because their candidate lost the presidential election. And churches divided left and right. You know, Jesus went into Jerusalem riding a donkey, but it wasn't that kind of donkey. Jesus doesn't care about politics. Jesus said, I'm the one you've been waiting for. And Christians are freaking out. There's a lot of Christians who are more excited about Trump returning than Jesus returning. <laughs> Jesus would say to us, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They want to take matters into their own hands. Jesus, do you still have no faith? Calvary Chapel, we need to trust God no matter what. If we're with him, if we're in the boat with Jesus, then we won't have a father in heaven who says with a sad face, no, he did not trust his father enough to jump. I want the answer to the question, do you still have no faith? I want the answer to be no, Lord. We trust you heart and soul. It says they were terrified and asked each other, who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. Now I'm going to close here. I have to do it more quickly than I thought, but I'm going to tell him myself a little bit. This question, do you still have no faith? Preceded by, why are you so afraid? Has been haunting me. You know, ever since we announced unusual kindness and this huge step of faith God is taking, I have been bombarded by the enemy. I mean, the nightmares, believe me, you do not want to be in my head at night. <laughs> Sleeping is difficult. Everything is like the devil is shouting at me. That's a sign from God. You can't do a free restaurant. And, and you have all these questions. The question is, am I going to jump when he tells me to jump? Why am I so afraid? Well, in those times when I'm afraid, and again, fear is natural. I don't want anybody to feel guilty if you're afraid of stuff. I'm afraid of stuff. But you can't let the fear keep you from getting to the other side when Jesus said, here's where we're going. That's so important for us to understand. And all Jesus wants to do is say, get in the boat, that's where you're safe, and no matter how rough the road is or the ride is, we're going to be okay. They were terrified and asked each other, what kind of man is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. I'm going to close today by telling you what kind of man our Jesus is. Psalm 89, verse 8. O Lord, God Almighty, who is like you? You are mighty, O Lord, and your faithfulness surrounds you. You rule over the surging sea. When its waves mount up, you still them. The heavens are yours, and yours also the earth. You founded the world and all that is in it. That's the kind of man he is. That's the Jesus we ask you to believe in. I always think of his conversation with Job. The book of Job was all of this time Job crying out, why? His friends crying out, why? They came to the conclusion that, well, Job, you must be messing up because our God wouldn't punish anybody. This wouldn't happen if you were just right with God. We Christians have that misunderstanding as well. Well, if I'm serving God, then nothing bad's going to happen. That's just exactly the opposite. And Job protested, I haven't done anything wrong. They didn't believe him. And the whole first part of the book is people asking God, why is this happening? There's never an answer to the why question 
Job tells, or God tells Job, you can ask me why when you can tell the waves that you may come here and no farther. Here is where your proud waves halt. I shared, and this is a little embarrassing, but we go to the beach. I love the beach. It's my, my safe place in the world. I love to sit and watch the water come in and just let the waves pour in. And I can't tell you how many times I've shouted at the waves, Stop right here! <laughs> just to see if it would ever happen. It's never happened. <laughs> but all of that to say, since I can't make the waves stop, ought I not to depend on the one who can? And that's true for each and every one of us. We serve a wonderful, powerful God who loves you. And in those times, in the storms, in the tests and trials of life, in those times when you feel like God's not there, He doesn't care, why are you letting this happen? We need to remember who He is. If we'll believe in the depth of our hearts that God said we'll go to the other side, we've got to believe we're going to get there. And that's how we get through storms. That's how we learn from the storms. And that's how we become more and more like Jesus every day. He loves you. He's proven it. He wants you to trust in that love. And when you're in over your head, as your pastor, what I want you to do is think, well, now I'm in the only place I can be safe, and that's where I know I have to depend on Jesus. He may feel like he's sleeping in the boat, but if that's the case, you know what the best thing to do is? Go take a nap with Jesus. And then when he gets up and he does this and says, come on, jump. I'll catch you. Then there's nothing left to do but to jump. You can trust him. He wants to prove it to you. Let's pray.